Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's learning session. The link between protected areas and climate change organized by WWF's Forest and Climate Program. Thanks for taking the time to join us. My name is Breen Burns, and I'm a manager for communications based at our WWF Washington, D.C. office. Our presenter today is Annalise Vergara, a policy officer with the Amazon Vision Team, which is part of the WWF Living Amazon Initiative. Annalise is based in Quito, Ecuador, and she'll do a brief introduction of herself in a few moments. This webinar is part of our monthly series in which we invite experts on forests, climate change, and red issues to share their expertise with us. So if this is your first time joining, please know that we have more than 30 archive sessions you can watch online, or if you are a returning attendee, welcome back and we're happy to see you again. So before we begin, I'd like to go over a few logistics and some frequently asked questions. And again, for those of you who have participated in the past, this will all be familiar. But the answer to our most frequently asked question is yes, today's presentation is being recorded and you can find the recording within a day on our YouTube channel. To get to the recording, just go to youtube.com and search for WWF Forest and Climate or go to youtube.com slash WWF Forest Climate. It's right there on your screen as well. There are two audio options. You can listen via your computer speakers or you can dial in through the number that was provided in your registration email. It's important to note that if you experience audio difficulties while listening through your computer, this is sometimes caused by having too many software applications or internet windows open. So feel free to close some of them and that usually solves the issue or you're always welcome to join through the phone. If you're having any technical difficulties, please send my colleague Jenny Guzman a message via the chat area if possible and we'll try to get it sorted out. Questions are absolutely welcome. Please hold them until the end of the session when we get to the Q&A portion. At that point, you can send your questions in using the question toolbar on your screen, and we will answer as many as possible during our allotted time. And after the webinar, you'll receive a link in your follow-up email to our YouTube channel where you can find a recording of the session. So thank you again for joining us. And with that, we'll get started. And I will turn it over to Annalise. So Annalise, please feel free. Thanks. Hi, Breen. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the webinar. I'm very excited to be here uh, with you today. As Breen mentioned, I'm based in Quito, Ecuador, and I work for the WWF uh, Living Amazon Initiative at a project uh, that focuses in, in the Amazon and protect areas as natural solutions to, to climate change. In the past, um, I've collaborated with uh, UNEP's Youth Advisory Council as an associate advisor for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, I've also worked for the Ecuadorian government uh, in the areas of uh, environmental policy and as a climate change negotiator. And I've also had the chance to, to collaborate with uh, some research opportunities at the, uh, the Grantham Research Institute in, in the UK. And I hope that, that today we will be able to satisfy all expectations on the topic. I will be talking about the link between protected areas and climate change. In particular, the idea of protected areas as natural or nature-based solutions to climate change. Uh, the, the idea behind this is that protected areas can play a key role in addressing climate change by increasing the resilience of ecosystems and communities, by mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, and by offering tools for adaptation to, to climate impacts, which is the first uh, point that we will cover. The second one, on the other hand, uh, protected areas somehow need to be designed and managed in a certain way so that they can withstand climate change and provide these natural solutions that we are expecting them to provide. And on the third point, I will also be discussing um, the case of the Amazon, which I think is very interesting for, for all of us who are interested in forests and the Amazon vision. And finally, I will tell you a little bit about the regional agreements that will be taken to COP21 in Paris by the Latin American Protected Area System Directors. Um, can we go to the next one, Green? I can't seem to to do it myself. Sorry. To be able to do it. Great. Thanks. 
Okay, so to kick off this webinar, I wanted to show you an engram, which is a way of, of organizing information in terms of uh, the words that appear in books. In this case, it is the Google Books engram viewer. And this somehow illustrates society's interest in different topics. And I've added here a few environmental issues, including climate change, Amazon biodiversity, uh, protected areas, ecosystem management, clean development mechanism, EBA, which is ecosystem-based adaptation, and deforestation and forest degradation. Unfortunately, as you can see, the data only goes up to 2008. Somehow, I think, anyways, it, it reflects uh, the current status of, of the interest in these topics. As you can see, um, while the interest in climate change has been increasing rapidly, the attention paid, at least in, in this framework, to issues such as biodiversity or protected areas has been a bit stagnant or has actually decreased through time. This is interesting because protected areas, the Amazon, biodiversity, etc., are part of what we can call the green infrastructure that the planet needs to face climate change. So this in a way puts us in a disadvantage in terms of addressing climate change because it shows that in many cases we're not paying enough attention to the natural tools that we have uh, in our hands to, for mitigation and adaptation. I think protected areas in a way are, are a space where these two uh, fields which were previously more separated can come together, conservation and climate change, and that a new vision of protected areas and conservation is necessary. Uh, one where climate strategies can benefit from conservation and where aligning these two strategies can become a very effective uh, strategy which is cost efficient and also uh, a bit more politically feasible than addressing the, the topics in a separate way. So on to the next one. The main message that I would like to convey today is that we need to have a new perspective from protected areas one which acknowledges the level of, of global importance they have in building resilience to climate change and the urgent need that we have to incorporate them in climate change planning and finance. So as Nigel Dudley et al. put it, um, protected areas are an essential part of the global response to climate change. Without them, the challenges would be even greater and their strengthening will yield one of the most powerful natural solutions to the climate crisis. So this evidently requires some kind of new, new vision, as I mentioned before, so that protected areas can continue to provide the benefits that they have been providing to society all along, but at the same time provide new benefits to society by contributing with climate change strategies and objectives, and on top of that, that they can overcome the challenges that uh, climate change brings to natural systems in, generals, in general and to protected areas in particular. In that sense, I think uh, two key questions are, what can protected areas do for us in a climate change context, and what does it require in terms of design and management? If you're interested in, in reading, in seeing more about um, the arguments that support this idea of natural solutions to climate change, I've put a link to our video there. Uh, you will see that there's a number of links throughout the presentation and I wanted to let you know that the presentation will be available for, for everyone who attended and everyone who's interested so that you will be able to access this information um, later on. Okay, now on to the next one. I think uh, now talking specifically about how protected areas are natural solutions to climate change, I would like to begin with adaptation, which I think is the least understood part of this equation. So what do protected areas do in terms of adaptation? For us, they build social ecological resilience and they buffer in the impacts of climate change. Um, how do they do it? They help maintain ecosystem integrity in a climate change context and uh, this ends up benefiting us in three main ways, us or the planet more generally. The first way is that they protect biodiversity from climate change. The second one, they protect surrounding communities. And the third one, they protect the economies in the cities uh, in a more regional, wider view of things. So uh, how do they protect biodiversity? If managed with climate change criteria, protected areas can facilitate self-adaptation of species. And you will see that there are some, some examples in the last column. Um, 
in terms of what they do for communities, they provide livelihoods, they regulate the local climate, and they can also reduce the risks and buffer the impacts of extreme climate events. Uh, and finally, how do they protect economies or uh, provide for, for economies on a more wider scale and cities? They uh, can increase the resilience of productive systems, including agricultural systems. They can also provide inputs for production. And very importantly, they protect watersheds and sustain uh, supplies of, of clean water. There are many ways of organizing these functions, but I find this kind of framework quite, quite useful for understanding the different adaptation functions of uh, protect areas. And now uh, on to the next one in terms of mitigation, which I think is um, more, more un well understood in, in general, uh, the role of protect areas is um, that they can prevent the release of carbon and they can also sequester carbon uh, from the atmosphere into natural ecosystems. In fact, over 300 gigatons of carbon are present in protect areas um, currently, and there's also a large potential for, for new carbon sinks or enhanced carbon sinks within protect areas and within new protect areas. Uh, this potential carbon sinks can be um, reached through what we can call ecosystem-based mitigation or activities focused on reforestation and restoration of, of existing areas, as well as uh, creation of new areas in, in carbon-rich landscapes. It's important also to, to know that even though protect areas can be a solution for mitigation, they can also become a net carbon source if they are degraded or not managed effectively. And um, also good to mention that there are many synergies between the adaptation and mitigation actions that, that protected areas can provide. Um, now on the advantages of protected areas over other ecosystem-based approaches, I think this, this part of the presentation is, is very important because uh, many of us have heard of how ecosystems of, or forests in general can help with mitigating and up to climate change but don't really know what, what is so special about protect areas, what makes them different from, from other approaches, and what is um, what are the, the elements that make them more efficient in terms of providing solutions to climate change. So here are some of the main advantages that protect areas uh, offer. The first one are the legal frameworks and safeguards that are in place. Um, the second one is the proven conservation effectiveness of these areas. The third one, the established governance structures. Um, forward is the available information, uh, such as for carbon quantification, etc. The fifth one, which is uh, very important, is the commitment to long-term use of land, which is also related to the legal frameworks that are in place and permanence. And the sixth one, the, the large global and land surface cover and large carbon reserves that they have. Um, nowadays, uh, protected areas cover around 13% of the land surface of the planet and also a significant percentage of uh, the ocean surface. There are two, uh, some, two additional and very important advantages that I would like to mention. The first one is uh, cost efficiency and the fact that protected areas require long low startup costs, which makes them very attractive in a developing country context, and um, the robustness of the adaptation actions that they can provide, which means that protected area solutions can often work under uh, a very wide range of future change, uh, climate change scenarios. So uh, this is, these are some of the advantages. That, there are more, but in terms of, of the fact that they're already there, that they're proven strategies, uh, low cost, robust, cost effective, that they integrate both mitigation and adaptation, and that they can be enhanced um, in terms of improving their management and also increasing number and size. I think these are uh, some of the important arguments that, that you can uh, see uh, somehow illustrate why protected areas are important, why we should care about them. And um, so on to the next slide. Of course, protected areas can be natural solutions to climate change, but only if they themselves are able to, to withstand climate change. 
So how will protected areas be affected by climate change? At a very general conceptual level, um, protected areas will, will have uh, to change their, their concept in a way. The definition of, that we have adopted of what a protected area is and what its conservation objectives are may have to evolve in, um, in a context of climate change, mainly because the notion that we currently have of protected areas is one of stationarity and fixed boundaries. And this doesn't necessarily work in a context of, of climate change. So in order for protected areas to keep uh, fulfilling their conservation objectives and helping us cope with climate change, they will um, be affected at a conceptual level and will have to start changing the way that we think about them and the way that we manage them. At a more uh, practical level, I would say, protected areas would be affected through the threats to their biodiversity. And as you can see in the graph, um, and everyone probably has heard of this, uh, climate change will bring changes in temperature, changes in seasonality, changes in precipitation, um, more uh, frequent and intense extreme events, chemical changes, and also sea level rise, among other things. And some of the impacts that it can have on biodiversity are a lack of synchrony, altered relations, and new interactions habitat loss, physiological stress, etc. So this change in biodiversity can change the ecosystem functions within a protected area and affect the provision of ecosystem services from that protected area. So how can we adapt protected areas to climate change? And when we try to adapt, when we think about adapting protected areas to climate change, enhancing resilience is a fundamental issue. And I find it very useful to have in mind the principles for ecosystem resilience according to this framework by the Stockholm Resilience Center, uh, which um, are general and they have to be applied according to the purpose and the context, which in this case would be to induce self-adaptability of protected areas by designing and managing them in a way that helps biodiversity adapt. So some of the principles are um, maintaining diversity and redundancy. Another one is managing connectivity in the sense that increased connectivity can be beneficial for um, changes in distributions of species, but it can be uh, detrimental for ecosystems if it's too high in some cases. It also includes fostering complex adaptive systems thinking, which is very important in, a, in terms of uh, thinking about climate change and the uncertainties that, that we have in protected area management. And it includes other important variables such as promoting learning, uh, enhancing participation, and polycentric governance. Now on to the next one. Um, if we kind of translate these principles and others to more specific level, here are a number of key recommendations that could help adapt protected areas to climate change and therefore help them um, increase the chances of helping us cope with climate change. Some of them are to expand them in number and size. Uh, the second one is to plan for larger scales and link to other forms of conservation. Uh, this means creating larger or large protected areas surrounded by buffer zones and compatible land uses. And it also means, for, um, means planning for ecological networks that surpass national boundaries. Um, it also means that very importantly in case for the, cases like the Amazon and other biomes, uh, linking to other forms of conservation such as community-based conservation, private initiatives, uh, zoning, and indigenous territories which are very, very important uh, management and conservation spaces and opportunities. Um, the third one is to uh, increase connectivity or manage connectivity, as I mentioned before, to mitigate existing threats, to study the responses of species to climate change and manage accordingly, to restore ecosystems and habitats, to increase representativity and plan for redundancy, this means representing species in more than one protected area, if appropriate, improving governance and interinstitutional coordination, and improving management. And now on to the next one. I think the, the main challenge for adapting protected areas to climate change is that the actions that enhance biodiversity resilience don't always enhance the resilience of ecosystem services that we want for adaptation and mitigation. 
So that's why, in a sense, we have to take a special care to balance these two objectives so that protected areas can fulfill the new expectations that we have of them with regards to providing natural solutions to climate change without neglecting their conservation uh, objectives. Interestingly, though, there are um, particular biomes like the Amazon, which we'll start talking about, which are large, carbon-rich, and biodiversity-rich, where it is possible to align these two objectives, enhancing resilience of biodiversity and enhancing uh, resilience of ecosystem services for mitigation and adaptation. So now on to the Amazon, which is my favorite part, I think. <laughs> the Amazon is the world's largest tropical forest. Um, the Amazon covers an area of 6.7 million square kilometers. Um, it plays a very important role in regional and global climate regulation. It also holds 10% of the planet's known biodiversity, and its rivers discharge 15% of the world's fresh water into the Atlantic Ocean. The Amazon is also a, a space where, where many people live. It's um, the home for over 34 million people. Um, who live in eight different countries. Those are Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Brazil, Guyana, Suriname, and, and the overseas territory of French Guyana. And this population includes 2.7 million indigenous peoples from uh, over 350 ethnic groups, uh, 60 of which live in isolation. Uh, indigenous territories actually are quite uh, predominant in the Amazon. Indigenous territories and protected areas cover nearly 50% of the biome. Um, they cover 170 million hectares, and there are over 390 protected areas in the Amazon. So you can see the scale of the importance that, that protected areas and other conservation forms have in maintaining resilience of the Amazon biome. And now um, I would like to talk to you about what you can see over there. There's, there's a logo of the Amazon vision. So the ecosystem-based vision of biodiversity conservation for the Amazon biome, known in short as the Amazon vision, is the initiative of the Amazon countries that started around 2009, which was recognized by, by the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, within the program of work on protected areas and supported by, by a memorandum of understanding between uh, Red Parques, which is the Latin American Network for Protected Area Systems, the Secretariat of CBD, IUCN, and WWF. This vision seeks to maintain the ecosystems, uh, goods, and services to society by keeping the integrity, functionality, and biome resilience under the effects of human pressure in a climate change context. To implement this vision, uh, Red Parques and WWF Living Amazon Initiative are leading a regional effort to strengthen Amazon protected area systems and transboundary ecological networks, and to include the role of protected areas in climate change strategies and development plans through the project called um, Amazon Vision Protected Areas Natural Solutions to Climate Change, also known as NASC which is part of a wider program on, on Amazon protected areas integration. You will see a, a few maps that are being developed within this, this project and which will be part of a larger resilience study uh, of the Amazon biome and vulnerability analysis of the Amazon biome that will be available by COP21 and will be launched there in Paris. Okay, so the next one. So the Amazon provides uh, many fundamental ecosystem services for the region and globally as well that contribute to support livelihoods and uh, that are a very important part of the uh, Amazon country's economies. The services include climate stabilization, um, provision of water, food, timber, etc., non-renewable natural resources, cultural services, and of course carbon sequestration, which is what you, you can see in the map that is uh, there. So um, protected areas, as I mentioned before, um, contain over 312 gigatons of carbon globally. That is about 15% of the global terrestrial carbon stock. Of that, the Amazon contains around half, and around 50 gigatons of that are uh, present in protected areas of the Amazon. 
The ARPA program alone, which is the Brazilian Amazon Region Protected Areas program, has an estimated stock of 4.5 gigatons, which, if they would be cut down, uh, would the trees would be cut down, would emit approximately 1.8 billion tons of CO2. Um, the Amazon um, is also a very important hydrological cycle, which determines the the weather that and the climate in, in South America. But it's very sensitive to changes in the biome structure due to deforestation and degradation, which combined with uh, global stain uh, with climate change can actually affect the capacity of the Amazon to regulate the climate and to maintain these carbon stocks. Plus, a recent study claimed that there is a reduced removal of carbon by Amazon trees due to climate change already. So this means that uh, climate change with other threats could even change the status of the Amazon from a net sink, which it currently is, to a net source of atmospheric CO2. And this is a very important threat that we have to take into account um, and try to prevent because it would have major implications in, in the future scenarios that we may experience in climate change. And okay, so now um, about I would like to talk a little bit more about the risks of Amazon protected areas. The Amazon um, is in a relatively good ecological state, but it has already lost 17% of its vegetation due to land use changes in the past 50 years. That is about 1.1 million hectares, and a similar surface of the biome uh, suffers from degradation in varying degrees. Several activities currently threaten the Amazon, such as uh, the expansion of the agricultural frontier, etc. Um, the Amazon has already increased an increasing temperature; has already experienced an increasing temperature of 0.5 to 0.8 degrees Celsius during the century. And according to general circulation models, the temperature of the Amazon could increase by two or three degrees by 2050 and precipitation could decrease during the dry months, uh, causing longer, more severe droughts and changes in seasonality. Some of the impacts um, that this could bring are forest dieback, increased erosion and loss of valuable soils, degradation of freshwater systems, loss of biodiversity and change of rainfall patterns in in South America. The last one uh, is very interesting because uh, because of the size of the Amazon, the ecological structure that it has, and the location in between the equator, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Andes, the Amazon produces um, some kind of hydrological engine or pump that generates favorable climate conditions regionally and globally, which could uh, change if the uh, resilience of the Amazon is not enough to withstand some of these changes of the climate. And now um, a very interesting map of, of these risks um, on, the, on the Amazon biome that are brought by climate change, which is, is a preliminary result of the project as well, and the objective will be finally to identify um, conservation opportunities and priorities uh, in the Amazon for a regional network of protected areas. So what this uh, map is telling us is that the areas most at risk from climate change um, impacts and, and other variables are in the southeastern part of the biome, at the Andean Piedmont, and along the Amazon River. Okay, okay. So now on mainstreaming protected areas and climate change strategies. Why is it important to mainstream protected areas and climate change strategies? The objective in this case is um, to to recognize and scale up the efforts. Uh, for the integration of protected areas into climate change strategies and development plans and include climate change criteria in protected areas management. Um, mainstreaming of protected areas should be a priority for us in order to realize the potential they have in the strategies for adaptation and mitigation to increase the resilience of this green infrastructure that I mentioned at the beginning, which is the one that allows us uh, to face climate change in a more perhaps not easy, but easier way. Okay, and the next one I wanted to show you an example of uh, the integration of protected areas in climate change strategies, um, such as 
in, in the Amazon countries we have around 39 climate change strategies if you consider uh, regulations, policies, strategies in different sectors. Uh, of those, around 23 pro uh, mentioned protected areas and uh, a bit over half of those actually mention protected areas and adaptation solutions. The rest of them, um, many of them motion, mentioned them as mitigation solutions and many mentioned just forests in general and not protect areas as a specific management tool um, that can be used for, for climate change strategies. Some of these uh, policy instruments are, for example, Bolivia's National Adaptation Mechanism, Brazil's National Climate Change Policy and Climate Change Plan, Colombia's um, National Strategy for Articulation of Climate Change Policies and Actions, and uh, Ecuador's Ministry of Court for Inclusion of Climate Change in Local Planning. Okay, now on to the next one. So that was a, at a national level. At a regional level, I wanted to tell you about a very interesting initiative that has been developing in the last few months from the Latin American countries, which will be taken to COP21. This is the Red Parques Declaration. As I mentioned before, Red Parques is the Latin American government's network for technical cooperation on protected areas. Um, Red Parques, um, together with WWF Living Amazon Initiative through the Amazon Vision Projects is leading the way in delivering a strong message of the, the role of protected areas in particular um, in responding to climate change uh, globally through the NASC project. Red Parques, which is currently chaired by Peru, which is the, the current COP president, uh, started um, an Amazon-wide effort which then transcended to the to the rest of the region in the past few months where they decided to, to draft a declaration on the role of protected areas in climate change for COP21. Um, the countries which are members of Red Parques got together in Lima last month at the Red Parques Council meeting on August 14 where they debated a final draft of the declaration and agreed on, on the declaration text. The countries that signed this agreement uh, were Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, Colombia, Cuba, Ecuador, uh, French Guyana, Guatemala, Guyana, um, Honduras, Nicaragua, Peru, Panama, Uruguay, and Venezuela. The declaration calls for the inclusion of protected areas in global climate change discussion and actions, and it was a very important first step in a, in a more long-term process of mainstream and protected areas as climate change solutions at, at all levels. So in the next one, uh, what does the declaration actually say? Some of the Red Parque's commitments are to um, carry out additional efforts for protected area management with regional and sub-regional interactions in the context of the UNFCCC, to implement uh, the CBD's program of work on protected areas and IHG Gulf 11, including uh, and in particular the design and management of protected areas with climate change criteria to promote participatory management of biodiversity and work with local communities, indigenous peoples and traditional populations, to integrate protected areas in adaptation and mitigation strategies, including the National Adaptation Plan, SNAPS, uh, to recognize national protected areas and mitigation strategies with benefits beyond carbon, and to monitor and report the contribution of protected areas to mitigation and adaptation, and finally to create awareness on the role of protected areas in mitigation, adaptation, resilience, and sustainable development. On the next one, uh, what does Red Parques and ask for, for COP21 um, for the recognition? of the national and regional efforts to improve protected areas contribution to addressing climate change nationally and with respect to international goals, for increased attention for protected areas as responses to climate change, and for increased scientific, technical, technological, and financial support for protected areas management with climate change criteria. And finally, um, in terms of 
the international level and the COP and how uh, we can mainstream protect areas and climate change strategies. As we approach the COP, it's almost only two months away. So the message uh, that I would like you to take away from this webinar, which is the message that the Latin American um, protected area system directors are carrying as well, is that protected areas need to be integrated in global climate planning and finance through political and technical challenge within the UNFCCC as a way to increase our chances for a climate resilient and sustainable development. In a way, it is a safe bet. It's one of those win-win situations. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, excluding protected areas from our climate change uh, thinking can have very negative consequences. So how can we start mainstreaming protected areas into UNFCCC discussions in particular? Well, there, there are many ways, and uh, this has to be seen as a long-term process. But one, some of the things we have identified are enhancing the role of nature-based strategies in, in the INDCs, uh, both in drafting the INDCs, which are, most of them should be in their final stages of drafting right now, uh, the INDCs are the intended nationally determined contributions uh, that countries have to submit to the convention with what they put on the table as their as their uh, what they're offering to do in terms of mitigation and adaptation and the means of implementation that they require in, in some cases. We've um, drafted a set of recommendations which, which you can also access uh, from the presentation afterwards on how to include nature-based strategies and indices with a special focus on taking advantage of protected area systems as an important infrastructure in these nature-based strategies within the INDCs. Um, there's also things that can be done in terms of incorporating protected areas and climate change strategies at, at all levels. As I mentioned before, the Amazon countries seem to be um, quite advanced in this in terms of recognizing the role, if not in implementing actions already so much, uh, recognizing the role of protected areas for adaptation and, and mitigation promoting synergies between the national biodiversity strategies and action plans. These are the NBSAPs um, under the, the Convention of Biological Diversity uh, and the National Adaptation Plans, the NAPs, or the National Adaptation Programs of Action, the NAPAs, which are um, related to the least developed countries. Uh, we also have including climate change criteria and protected area system strategies and protected areas management plans, enhancing protected areas to reduce the occurrence of loss and damage, promoting red plus in protected areas when appropriate, and finally developing knowledge and guidelines for protected areas, uh, specific action uh, such as through the Nairobi work program of the UNFCCC which is a body that um, is dedicated to developing knowledge on adaptation. Um, there's also other opportunities that will be coming up soon with the SDGs, for example, uh, to link protect areas as one of the important solutions to climate change and other things that can be done at a regional level depending on, on regional policies and the articulation uh, among countries at a biome level as the Amazon. Um, that's all I have for now. I'll uh, be very glad to take all of your questions and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Annalise. And so now we're at the question and answer portion. And just as a reminder, there's a tool on your GoToWebinar bar that's called the questions tool or the question section. So if you have questions for Annalise, please just type your question in there and we will answer as many as we have time for. Um, here today. So Annalise, the first question is, how will this declaration be presented at the COP? Okay, so um, as I mentioned, Red Parques is led currently by Peru, which is the COP president. And so this uh, declaration on protected areas has, has been fortunately linked to the work of Peru in the Lima Paris Action Agenda. And so we, we don't know yet how or it will be presented, but we have we we know 
of the interest of Peru to include this as one of the activities of the forest component of the Lima Paris Action Agenda. So this will be one of the ways in which um, this declaration will be presented at COP21. Uh, on top of that, of course, we, we are organizing side events where we want to um, get together um, the system directors, the national protected area system directors of, of different countries in the Amazon biome and other Latin American countries such as Mexico, which are very advanced on this on these topics, to discuss the, the role of protected areas and, and to see what can be done at a in the future within the UNFCCC because this seems to be a very new topic. It's not really in the negotiation text, but it's something that that should not be left behind yeah, at the COP and beyond. Thank you. And just as we go through the questions, I'm just going to skip back a slide so at least we're not, we're looking at something with a little more meat on it there. Um, so the next question is from Dennis and Dennis asks, do we have or did we have concrete evidence of the importance of protected areas in contributing to adaptation? So can you talk a bit more about that, Annalise, please? Uh, well, yes, there, there are examples. Um, there are many examples, for example, of, of protected areas helping buffer the impacts of climate change. There are examples of protected areas uh, helping maintain provision of, of water in drought uh, situation caused by climate change, things, things like that. Um, there's, there's many interesting publications that I could perhaps provide the, the link to you, Bryn, so that you can make it available to, to participants later on. Sure. Um, but I would recommend as a, as a starting point the Natural Solutions publication by by IUCN, WWF, and, and others um, is a very important source of material for these kinds of, of evidence Thanks. of how areas help adaptation. Thank you, sure. And if you have any links, I can make sure that our participants receive links to documents and resources. So our next question is from Orly, and Orly asks, how was climate risk calculated exactly, and is there a method we can refer to? There is. Unfortunately, I'm not part of the technical team that, that we able, would be able to explain this to you in an appropriate way. So what I would say is um, we have preliminary results right now. The report, as I mentioned, will be ready for COP21. And as far as I know, it's um, not only taking into account future climate scenarios, but other variables related to social and ecological um, indicators. So I, I would prefer not to try to explain it because I might not do it the right way. So uh, what I would recommend is also that um, we can make available the information we have right now and that perhaps for the final report, it would be necessary to, to wait for the call. Sounds great. Thank you. So the next question is from Susanna, and Susanna asks, do you have a specific strategy for the COP? Will it include bilateral meetings or side events or something else? So can you talk a bit more about the plan or the strategy for the COP? Sure, well, um, the, the Lima Paris Action Agenda component uh, day on forests is on December 1st. That's the only thing we have fixed on our calendar now. Um, the other things would, will be events in the civil society venue, possibly um, a participation in one of the Amazon countries um, official events. Ecuador has expressed interest in this and possibly also an event in the German pavilion. These are all uh, events that haven't been confirmed yet but that we are hoping will, will come through. And in terms of bilaterals, of course, um, we, we've been talking about this with some of the delegations since the meeting that happened in Bonn in June, one of the intercessionals of the UNFCCC, and it's something that we continue to discuss with different countries to, to see what their perspective are, perspectives are on how protected areas can be included in the discussions of the COP. We've had some very interesting suggestions within uh, the Red Plus agenda, also within the Nairobi Work Program and things like that. And also uh, we, we seek to facilitate discussions between countries, which in this case are, are led by Red Parques, in terms of identifying those barriers or those doubts um, that could keep protected areas from uh, entering the debate. 
Thank you. And our next question, and thanks to everyone for sending in these good questions. Maricela asks, can you please expand on the role of indigenous territories as conservation areas? Does the Red Parques Declaration address this in some way? Or is a specific inclusion of that point? And Red Parques does talk about um, indigenous territories. They are very important spaces for, for coordination and for conservation, not only for conservation management, but also spaces for, for the development of cultural processes and, and livelihoods. So they're much more than protected areas in a way because they have a very important human component. And um, the idea of Red Park is, is to, to maintain coordination with, uh, with indigenous territories in a way that planning does not exclude the needs and the potential of these territories and that there can be networks that encompass different forms of conservation and they mention also uh, con conservation forms such as community-based conservation and others and that they can all um, man uh, have some kind of uh, regional vision of, of the, the conservation opportunities and the coordination opportunities that are there for protected areas and uh, indigenous territories. Thank you. Um, so Alexander asks, what was the process to catalyze action of the 16 countries that you mentioned and how can we mobilize other countries? Um, and then also how long did it take to catalyze action of those 16 countries? Okay, that, that's a great question because we actually do want other countries to, to be interested in this initiative and to join uh, as friends of the declaration or to have wider declarations of this kind uh, at the COP and beyond the, the COP. Uh, the process was started as an initiative of the project that I mentioned before, the uh, Protected Areas Natural Solutions to Climate Change. As a way to, to bring attention to this issue, it was Adop adopted by Red Park's presidency in charge uh, of Peru in February of this year. Uh, from February to, I think, uh, May, there was a, a draft text that was developed between um, the three project partners, which are Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia through the protected areas agencies of, of each of those countries. Then in, in June, as I mentioned during the negotiations, this was socialized initially in a very informal way with some other countries in the region and the text was enriched by their suggestions. And then from June to August of this year, Red Parques um, led a negotiation process on the text with its members where they sent their suggestions and changes to the text and these were incorporated into a final version which was um, discussed during the annual Red Parques meeting in August. In August um, the, the debate lasted many hours and at the end of the day all of the countries that were present in the meeting uh, signed the declaration and celebrated it in a, in a very positive way. Thank you. And so the next question is somewhat related. So Robin asks, and it's in terms of expanding it or um, including it to cover other parts of the world. So Robin asks, is there a parallel process to Red Parques operating around protected areas in sub-Saharan Africa? Could you repeat the question I missed? Part of it. Sure. The question is, is there a parallel process to Red Parques operating around protected areas in sub-Saharan Africa? Or in other words, is there a oh, okay. process in Africa happening that you know of? I don't know of any other regional network of protected areas. There is, of course, the World Commission on Protected Areas, um, which has already released many statements on the role of protected areas for climate change, but unfortunately I don't think there are any other uh, regional initiatives like Red Parques around the world. Might be wrong, but we haven't encountered them yet. Thank you. So the next question is from Omar, and Omar asks, how far can we go with these kinds of initiatives without Red Plus? Are there any challenges, risks, or negative points of addressing this approach? 
and is WWF considering alternatives for it? Uh, without Red Plus, right? Yes. So can can this happen okay. without Red Plus? Well, definitely, that's one of the advantages of protected areas. The the fact that they are part of the institutional structure of of many of the ministries of environment of countries. Of course, there is uh, like. Everywhere in conservation, there's not enough funds to do everything we, we want to do. But the, the fact that they are already established, that they have legal frameworks, etc., somehow um, gives a, some kind of guarantee, if not complete, that the, the, country, the, go the country's government have an obligation towards these areas. So Red Plus um, is a very important opportunity, but it only works under certain contexts. For example, uh, what can you apply Red Plus in a protected area where there are no threats of deforestation? Probably not, in terms of um, proving additionality. So. You, you do have to rely on other sources of funding, um, international cooperation and government funding for the areas that are uh, kept in a good conservation state, for example, that cannot enter Red Plus. In terms of the challenges, the neg negative um, issues related to this, um, I think one of the main challenges are that um, within the environmental policies of a country, at least in the, the examples we have seen regionally, sometimes the, the potential of protected areas is not recognized yet. So these are areas that in, in some cases cover up to 40% of a country. Uh, that's a very high percentage of, of land um, covered. So it represents almost half of a country, but still it is not taken into consideration sometimes when uh, the decisions um, of implementing other kinds of strategic projects are, are made or when um, policymakers are trying to, to find cost-effective solutions for, for climate change problems. So in a way it's, just, it's a, it begins with the, the problem of, of protected areas not being sufficiently recognized yet in their their very important roles for conservation, ecosystem provision, ecosystem services provision, sorry, climate change, etc. And uh, the challenge of getting this new language of, into a, a very complex set of discussions that, that involve climate change in particular within the UNFCCC, where new concepts, ideas, strategies often can take years to materialize into mechanisms or funding um, structures. So in a way, it's the, the challenge right now is that protected areas as solutions to climate change are still at an infancy stage in being integrated uh, in, in global policies. It's not that protected areas, um, it's not that we just found out that protected areas are natural solutions to climate change because this is something that, that people have been talking about for a few years already, but we haven't really been able to make that step yet on um, putting them into a priority agenda for, for countries and for policymakers. Thank you. And this is a, a bit of a follow up question. So, in terms of promotion of Red Plus in protected areas, do you have any ex specific examples of how that has happened or how that has worked from, from your role or from what you have seen? Uh, yes, Peru is, a, is an interesting case. They're one of the pioneers, I would say, in the region in terms of implementing Red Plus projects in protected areas. And I believe they have publications on the issue as well, so you, you may be able to find them uh, easily online. Thank you. So the next question is from Susan, and Susan asks, do you have examples of where adaptive governance has been used to help enable flexibility in shifting protected area boundaries in response to climate impacts? So for example, shifting species and habitat ranges? I don't know of cases where that has happened yet. Um, there's evidence that species are shifting already, but um, I don't think that we have reached that stage yet where governance uh, agreements have been made so that 
the boundaries of a protected area can be uh, more flexible because of climate change. There are um, examples of protected areas being expanded, for example, uh, but not necessarily uh, with a participatory process um, that accompanies some kind of new governance uh, mechanism that I know of, for example, in, I think, uh, in Ecuador as well, there were, there's been areas established, for example, to to guarantee provision of water for for Quito and and other schemes. And but I don't know of any examples in particular that would answer your question. I'm free. Thank you. Our next question is from Robin, a different Robin, and Robin asks, "What impact will increasing protected areas have on the livelihoods of the rural poor?" How will these areas be protected but still be usable by poverty-stricken communities in rural or isolated areas of the Amazon? Well, in the Amazon, um, there's protected areas with many different categories, with many different kind of restrictions. And I think it is very important um, to think of what, what this question is, is asking us to reflect about, which is people. As I mentioned, there's about 34 million people living in the Amazon. So evidently the, the concept that we have of a protected area uh, in, that can help us cope with climate change is not a protected area without people necessarily. It's a, it's a protected area that can accommodate the needs of people and that can be friendly to communities as well and that can actually help them cope with with, protect, with the impacts of, of climate change. So I think there's many ways to, to address that. Um, it hasn't necessarily been done in the best way in the past, but there are uh, opportunities for, for balancing those two objectives of providing for communities, respecting their rights, etc., and uh, also trying to increase the resilience of the biome. Thank you. The next question is from Julia. What is the main challenge in getting protected areas recognized as an effective strategy or effective strategies for climate change adaptation and mitigation in the UNFCCC? That's an interesting question, <laughs> a difficult one too. I think uh, it has to do a little bit with what I already mentioned before, the fact that protected areas are not yet part of the language that, that is used in the convention and that they're seen as something that belongs at, at the CBD or something like that. So I think the, the main challenge is for us as a, as a society or as a negotiating multilateral body to, to start thinking about synergies between different objectives and kind of breaking the silos between biodiversity and climate change development, etc. And, and I think perhaps um, some kind of thinking that is more oriented towards uh, resilient development or sustainable development can help break those barriers. But at this point, I think it's the level of specification and the kind of discrimination of other topics that, that has happened within the UNFCCC which makes it more difficult. And of course also the, the context of the negotiations. The fact that uh, the land sector and forests have been negotiating in a certain way for many years, the, the current mechanisms uh, don't necessarily refer specifically to protected areas, etc. So there are some more higher level conceptual challenges, I would say, and also some practical challenges that have to do with the way negotiations have happened and the decisions that have been uh, agreed on in the past few years, which are not necessarily against protected areas, but in a way do exclude the, that figure from, from the actions that are proposed. Thank you. And then we are almost out of time. So this will be our final question. And I think this will probably be an easy answer. Um, Robin asks, will you be presenting this work at the Global Landscapes Forum at COP21? And perhaps some of our attendees here today are going and are interested in seeing you in person, if so. Uh, we will definitely be presenting it at COP21. We don't know about the landscape forum yet, but 
um, it's something we, we are thinking about and it would be great um, to, to be able to meet personally with whoever has questions about this and also um, I'm open, we are open as a team and uh, to, to keep in communication open with all of you in case you need more information or are interested in this topic to, to know further. Well, thank you. And just a few more slides that I like to share with people for some additional resources from the Forest and Climate Program. So again, a reminder that the archive of this session is available online. It will be up later today along with a copy of this presentation so that you can click through to the links. We have a number of other resources here that you are welcome to check out if you're interested. And we hope you'll keep in touch with us. So you can always find us on Twitter. You can find our website there. And then if you have further questions for us or for Annalise and you need help getting to her, you can always reach us at this email address. And with that, I will bring us to a close here. Thank you so much to everybody who joined us today. And thank you so much to Annalise for that presentation. And we will see you next time. So thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Bye, everyone. Bye.